Hey everybody, Brett from Astartes Gaming here, back with another Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord uh, video. Today we're going to be looking at more of the blog post following all the Gamescom 2018 information that came out. This time around, uh, we're going to look at the just sort of overviews of the factions, whereas last time we looked at their individual troop trees. Uh, this is not going to be the same information that was in the faction overview video that I did before. That one was more based on the lower behind the factions as well as the inspirations uh, regarding like where they came from so you know which were real world cultures kind of uh, helped develop those particular factions this one's gonna be more about their starting situations in the campaign uh, so let's go ahead and dive on in we're gonna do the minor factions as well but not all of them are represented here so I'll just have to cover what's available uh, but we'll go in order, so starting with Kuzate, their leader is Monchug. Uh, these guys are, of course, the precursors to the uh, Kurgate, or Kurgi, or however you prefer to say that. Uh, so the Horse Archer faction, and they're very similar in style. They're basically identical, um, and you can see that among their clans, the, the Kurgi is how I prefer to say that, um, are actually one of them. And they only start out with a single war uh, with the Karakuzates, who I think got a name change because when they came out with the initial developer blog, unless this was a typo, I believe the minor faction was called the Karakurgi. And so it looks like maybe they decided to change things around and put them as a clan rather than a minor faction, and then they just changed the minor faction so that it was similar but you know not the same name. Anyways, uh, I don't think we've heard of Monchug before. In the developer blog, they never gave a specific name as to the leader. All they said was that there was um, a great conqueror, and then his lands got divided. And so apparently this guy is the one that took over the majority of those lands, or at least the lands that we're aware of. They're going to start out to the northeast, and so I think overall they're in a pretty strong starting position here. They're up against one of the edges of the map. Uh, actually, potentially two, because I think they do border on the northern edge as well. Because they're in that, that northeast corner. And then they're only at war with a minor faction within their own territory, so they can really pick and choose where they start their fights. And that's a great position to be in because um, a lot of these other factions will have to deal with a lot of other wars, especially with major factions, before they can move on to maybe conquering some easier territory. So, great starting situation for them. Then we have the Asurai, who are led by Unkid. We have heard about this guy. He's supposed to be a very colorful character. Uh, very pragmatic. He's not honorable, but he's not really dishonorable. He just kind of does whatever he fe feels like um, in that situation. They have eight clans as well. Uh, let's see. Yeah, eight clans, eight clans. I can't really speak to what the clans are going to offer because we don't know what each clan translates to in terms of like power or lords or anything like that because the clans are essentially just families and so we don't know if just like the patriarch of that clan is going to be leading armies or maybe it's the patriarch and one of his sons or two sons or uh, it could be like three brothers that are all leading armies. So really the, the clans don't tell us much unfortunately. Just uh, how many like noble families I guess are in there but again each noble family could vary in strength quite a bit. Anyways they are at war with the southern empire which is a major faction, of course, and then two minor factions. The uh, I I can't really read the the names too well, unfortunately. The resolution of these images just isn't high enough, or maybe it's my monitor. But it looks like Benny Zilal and Jawal. Anyways, minor factions, and so they'll be fighting on their northern border because, of course, they are the southernmost faction. And then within their own borders with these two minor factions. So they have a lot more going on to start with than the Kuzates do. Obviously it puts them in a weaker starting position. And I would say that given the terrain down there, which is a little bit more deserty, it's going to be harder for them to defend. The Kuzates are in a little bit rougher part of the map with a lot more mountains. And so there's more choke points. I don't think the Asurai have quite as many of those. And then they're also spread very thin along that southern part of the map. So while they're only 
going to have to worry about their northern border, at least initially, that northern border is very broad. And so I think they could have some trouble starting out. But I don't think they're the worst off by any means. Uh, then we get to the Batanians. I would argue that maybe these guys have the toughest start. So Caladog, uh, he's a bit crazy from what we heard about in the blog post. Uh, again, if you want more information, I recommend checking those out. I'm not going to go into too much detail about their leaders because, frankly, I don't remember it all. But I'll try to give you guys like a sentence or two about each one just so you can maybe recall if you read them already. Uh, they have seven clans, but again, I don't know that that means anything really. They are at war with the Valandians and the Wolfskins, which is a minor faction of theirs. Now, these guys share border with up to four major factions. I, I know there's at least three. So, to the west, basically the entire western half of their... Um, territory is bordered by Vlandia and then to the northeast and north roughly uh, they're bordered by the Sturgeons and then to the southeast they're bordered by one of the Imperial factions and then potentially I, I think one of the other Imperial factions maybe wedges its way in there somewhere as well but at least three and so because they're fairly central on the map I would not be surprised if this was frequently one of the earliest factions to get wiped out. In terms of troops, they do sort of seem to be the weakest. They have very poor cavalry. Their infantry is good, but they're very reliant on archers, which can be a difficult way to make your living because you need to be able to protect archers for them to be effective. Now, a smart player can use that to their advantage because their terrain is a uh, very dense forest. And so, you know, if you use hit-and-run tactics and rough terrain to kind of guard your weaker troops so that the cavalry can't just, you know, run through your archers and kill them all, you could be very effective. But I would wager that the AI is not going to be intelligent enough to do that effectively. And so the combination of these guys being surrounded at the start and not having strong infantry or cavalry... I, I shouldn't say strong infantry because they do have pretty decent infantry from what we can tell. But not having strong cavalry, I think, is going to put them in a pretty significant significant disadvantage where only really the player is going to be able to bail these guys out. And the player will have to play intelligent, intelligently to do that. So I think these guys will be a lot of fun to play because I think this will be one of the better challenges is you know not only keeping this faction afloat but trying to expand it. But again, I think if you're not going to play as them, you probably won't be seeing them for very long. All right, Northern Empire. So this is led by Lucan. Lucan is, of course, one of the senators from the senatorial faction that I described back in that faction overview video. I'm calling it the senatorial faction. That's not the official name, but it's a better descriptor, I feel like, than Northern Empire. Uh, because, really, it's not an empire. This guy has just declared himself uh, a candidate for the throne, or I, I guess technically he declared himself emperor, but he's not actually the emperor yet. And so uh, they are in the northeast part of what used to be the Empire. They're called Northern, but it is a little bit more Eastern. And they have seven clans. Again, not, else, not much else to say there. And what's interesting here is that they're only at war with the Western Empire. Well, and three minor factions. But in terms of major factions, only the Western Empire. I thought for sure that we would see a three-way civil war between the various imperial factions, but it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. Uh, and so I'll get more into that as we go through the others, but with the Northern Empire, I think they're going to have a pretty tough go of things because they obviously share border with both other imperial factions, both of which have uh, plenty of reason to try to take them out. They're also going to share a border with the Sturgeons and the Kuzates. And so the Kuzates aren't at war with anybody and might see the Northern Empire as maybe their best and easiest target starting out. Especially since they're already at war with the West and I'm sure will very quickly fall into war with the South. Uh, I, I could see these guys getting buried pretty early, too. Um, but they do have, in my opinion, a stronger troop tree than the Batanians. Very heavy infantry, very heavy cavalry. 
And so I think the AI will do a lot better with Imperial troops just because they're more straightforward to play. And so I think these guys will hold out longer than the Batanians, and depending on how things play out, they might persist for a while. But I could see things going very wrong for them, given the right set of circumstances. All right, so Southern Empire. Uh, this one's led by Regea. She is the empress, the wife of the dead emperor, and the mother of his daughter and only heir. And again, what's very interesting here they're at war with three minor factions, and then their only major faction that they're at war with is the Asurai. Which, again, I thought was really strange. I thought for sure that all three of these Imperial factions would be fighting for some claim at the you know, main Imperial throne. Which is currently held by the Southern Empire, by the way. The territory, or the, the town, city, whatever, that is where the Emperor was taking up residence and where he inevitably died, is in the Southern Empire's territory, and that's, I believe, where Regea has her base set up. So, one would think, sort of like in Roman history, where if somebody was going to make their claim as emperor, eventually they would try to work their way back to Rome and take it. Now, there's plenty of situations where that didn't happen. They just kind of set up their own empires in different places, but uh, inevitably there was some sort of civil war and clashing. And so you don't really see, for example, pieces of an empire split off and they're just kind of going to go their separate ways. So really, I feel like they should be at war. Like she should be at war with the other two. And then maybe the Asurai as well. But that's not what we're seeing here. Maybe it was a balance thing. Maybe uh, they started out that way and the, the developers saw that the Imperial factions just took each other out really early, and so maybe it didn't make for interesting playthroughs because uh, it was too easy to capitalize on their civil war or something. But really, um, I feel like that would be, you know, fairly true to history because that's often the best time to deal with an empire is when the empire is busy fighting itself. Uh, they have, let's see, eight clans, and then again, the one major war, three minor wars, they border, share a border with the two other Imperial factions, the Asurai, and possibly the Kuzates, but I think very minimally. Because the Kuzates are more northeast, and so I think just the southern tip of their territory might border with the Southern Empire. But overall, I think these guys are in a fairly strong starting position, given you know where they're set up. So... I think this will be a little bit easier if you're looking for an Imperial playthrough to kind of keep this one in the game rather than the North. Uh, and then we have the West. The West is led by the General Garlos. So this is what I was calling the um, military faction. So this one has... Oh, I forgot to mention that. This is the... I was calling this the Imperial faction, but that is kind of, you know, vague. But it makes... It's made up by the Imperial family. So again... Uh, Emperor's wife, the Empress, and his daughter, and also the populace. The The majority of the people are backing this group. Whereas the West is backed strictly by the military. So one of the famous generals and then his legions have staked a claim, you know, them supporting him. Uh, the North, in case it wasn't clear, Lucan being the senator and he is backed by the Senate and the aristocracy. So aristocratic, military, and then sort of populace. Wow. They have the most clans so far at 10. Uh, but again, only three minor wars and one major war with the Northern Empire. So it looks like unless something happens where they make peace for whatever reason, the North or the West is going to prevail over the other, and then maybe we'll see the victor of that going to war with the South to decide who's the actual Emperor. But I, I don't believe any of these wars are scripted. I'm pretty sure it's going to be like Warband, where they just kind of trigger. However, there are default relation statuses between factions, and so 
while they're not at war with the Southern Empire, chances are they probably have a very low starting relationship, which makes them more prone to war. So we could see maybe an early war between them, but I would wager that we're going to see a decisive, uh, you know, decisive war between the North and the West. Either Garlos or Lucan comes out on top, and then whoever wins that will likely end up at war with the South, and then if any of those factions survive, that will decide who is the Emperor. Now, the West is, I think, in a little bit more of a rough starting position. They share a border with uh, both Imperial factions, of course, the Batanians, the Valandians, and potentially the Asari. I don't remember how far up they come or how far south the West goes. But they have a few more major factions that they might have to potentially deal with early on. And so, this is another faction where I, I could see them going out pretty early. Again, between them and the North fighting each other, if another major faction jumps into that, uh, whichever one of those two factions is unfortunate enough to have that happen to them, I think they'll go out per pretty quickly. So, a little bit more of a challenge here. So yeah, of the three Imperial factions, I really do think the Southern faction, which is, of course, led by the Imperial family, is probably the easiest of the three in terms of starting situation. Right, then we have the Sturgeons, who are in the north, uh, northwest, but mostly the entire north. They start out at war with just two minor factions. So again, a pretty easy starting situation for them, uh, where they're kind of on the outskirts and they can pick and choose where they want to fight. And I could see them going after the Batanians' territory. The Vlandians, of course, start out at war with them, and so... I think often what's going to happen is the Sturgeons will declare war on the Batanians and there will be a race to gobble up Batanian territory. Uh, we could also see them try to capitalize on the war with between the Empire. And I don't think this would be smart necessarily. Actually, it could, it could play out depending on your goals. But you could maybe see Sturgia go to war with the Kuzates early on and try to eliminate them as a threat before anybody else turns their attention to Sturgia. So that's an option as well, but of course they don't start out at war, and so unless you went seeking that war, it probably wouldn't come very soon. Uh, they have eight clans, which seems to be more or less the standard number. Uh, Regenvod, I don't remember anything about him as a leader, so I, I can't really say much as to what his you know overall philosophy was. But I think these guys are in a pretty good starting position, and you could definitely, definitely... Uh, make some early moves that could eat, bolster their uh, standing even further. And then finally we have the Valandians, which of the troop trees were kind of like my winner from that video. I liked their troop tree the best of all the others. And that wasn't to say, and some people kind of confuse this in the comments of that video, uh, I, I'm not saying by any means that they're the best troop tree, or they're the best faction. They had, in my mind, the most balanced troop tree. Which is to say that they didn't really have the best of any one type of troop, but they didn't really have any weaknesses in their troop tree either. They had pretty solid cavalry, pretty solid infantry, and pretty solid uh, crossbowmen. They also had pikes, which I think will really help them counter enemy cavalry. But I would argue that the Imperial factions and the Kuzates have better cavalry. I would argue that the Imperial factions... And the Sturgeons have better infantry. And I would argue that the Batanians, and possibly the Asari, have better archers. So, really, they're, they're your very balanced, middle-of-the-pack faction where they don't have any great strengths, but they don't have any great weaknesses. And so, as a player, that kind of speaks to me because I can be very versatile with my army design. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the most interesting because some people just really like to play cavalry heavy armies and you could do that with this faction but they're not going to be uh the swadia that people remember where you just can run knights and nothing else and you'll just steamroll everybody i don't think that valandian knights are going to be quite so powerful especially since we know that other factions have things that are uh potentially even tankier and more deadly like uh the cataphracts or the clibinari or um I don't recall 
Uh, the Asari had some pretty heavy cavalry as well. And then, of course, the um, Kuzates are all about cavalry, so they have a huge variety. Although they're more horse archer oriented, so I don't think in like a straight clash, the Kuzate Lancers would beat Valandian Knights. But obviously, they have various other cavalry types to kind of counter that. Uh, again, they're at war with the Batanians, and then one minor faction. So, you could argue that by being at war with a major faction, they are in a bit of a bad position. But I do think that because of the Batanian central location, they are just going to get completely cannibalized by the rest of the map. And so you'll see other factions slowly declaring war on them, and trying to just kind of get pieces of territory from them before they fall apart entirely. I don't think you'll see a lot of that with the Vlandians, who are um, the westernmost faction, and you know, fairly coastal to where you know they don't share borders with a lot of other factions. But they they do share them with some. Um, the Asari to the south, the Sturgeons slightly to the north, the Batanians obviously uh, to their northeast, and then the Western Empire to the east. So yes, they do share borders with several factions, but because they share a border with the Batanians and are at war with the Batanians, I think that's going to be the main focus. I do think the Batanians are going to get the worst of that, and I do think a lot of other factions are going to jump in on them and take them apart, and so I think Philandia will do just fine, and if you're looking to get a very early start in terms of battles and fighting and whatnot, I think this would be a great faction to play. I'm interested in playing them already just because I really, again, like their troop tree and the balance that it brings for, you know, various combined arms tactics, which I really like to employ. So, yeah, I think overall they're in a pretty good position to start from. Let's look at the minor factions now. It's going to be hard to say much about these. Uh, we will know who they're at war with based on um, this, but unfortunately it's not going to tell us here. And so... Each of these minor factions does have a leader and then three members. And so I think what we can assume from that is that they're going to have basically four armies running around. So they'll have the army led by the leader and then each of these guys will also have an army. And so they do have some potential threat inherent to just having that many armies. I don't know, I don't know if anybody knows, other than the developers themselves, if they're capable of taking land, or if they start with any land. I would assume that they are. If they're going to be commanding armies on a map, I would assume that they can, in fact, take and hold castles and towns and stuff like that. At least I hope they can. But to me, it makes logical sense that they would be able to. We don't know if they will start out with any. I would assume not but you never know and we definitely don't yet so it's possible that they already have land it's possible that they can take land but it's also possible that they don't and won't be able to uh, so that said it's still gonna be interesting dealing with them it does remind me a little bit of prophecy of pendor in that way where in prophecy of pendor there were uh, not minor factions, well, I mean, kind of minor factions, but generally they were, like, a party, or, I guess there was a few that had multiple parties, but there was groups outside of the major factions that you could fight with, and generally in that mod they were incredibly powerful and very deadly, and you kind of wanted to avoid them, but it did make it interesting, because then you had stuff happening and people to fight even outside of your normal traditional wartime, you know, when you're calling up campaigns to go conquer lands from other major factions, there was still other things that you could, you know, do battle against to earn XP and loot and gold and all that stuff. And so I think that these minor factions will really add to the game in that way as well. Uh, but anyways, that's enough about minor factions in general. I'm just going to read the descriptions here because there's not a whole lot outside of that to talk about with these guys. So uh, the company, uh, the company of the Golden Boar, that is, are Valandians, 
Most local, mostly local levies who don't adjust well to peacetime and opted for a life of constant warfare. They are probably the least disciplined and most brigandish of Calradius mercenaries, and a scourge that any bit of countryside, to any bit of countryside where they are allowed to run loose. Still, like all mercenaries, they know that their future earnings depend on their reputation, so they honor their contracts and practice their skills, particularly with crossbow, to ensure their employers receive their money's worth. Okay. Um, one thing they have mentioned regarding minor factions is that they will be able to be hired as mercenaries, and so these guys look to be a pretty straightforward mercenary company. And so I'm willing to bet what happens is you go talk to their leader, um, discuss the contract or whatever. They probably just have like a flat sum that they r require in order for them to fight for you. And then they'll basically just go to war with whoever you're at war with and their parties will run around and attack them. So potentially you could add four more armies to your campaign or whatever when you go to war if you have the money for it. So that's kind of cool. One thing I think that Warband really lacked was that even if you were incredibly, incredibly rich, it could be difficult to keep armies up if you were constantly fighting because no amount of money would get you enough troops at times because you were always limited by the number of villagers you could go grab or how quickly you could go grab them. Obviously, there was mercenaries in taverns, but those were kind of hit and miss. They weren't always there. And so now you have entire mercenary armies that you can pay, and they worry about their own recruitment and whatnot, and you're just paying them to show up and fight. So I really do like that. Um, again, I, I mentioned this stuff just a second ago about minor factions and what they'll add. I think making minor factions mercenaries adds even more in that regard as well, because now you have mercenaries that aren't just a small part of your army that you have to worry about recruiting, it's, you know, go pay these guys and the mercenaries will fight for you. Okay, moving on. The Brotherhood of the Woods. So this is also a Valandian faction. And uh, you can kind of tell the Valandians all have more or less the same helmets. It's pretty obvious. But interestingly, they start out with the at war with the Valandians, where uh, these guys do not. So, the Brotherhood of the Woods started as a Valandian peasant movement, hiding out in the forests, robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. However, it encountered uh, the problems that any long-running rebel movement might. It needed to ensure a steady supply of food, and also ensure that none of the poor would dare earn a bag of coin by informing on them. Slowly but surely, it began to make use of extortion, terror, and corrupt deals with the local authorities to survive, becoming little different from any other organized bandit group in Calradia. Alright, well I can see how they um, ran into problems with the major faction there. It doesn't sound like they're mercenaries quite in the same way. I wonder if we'll still be able to hire them. But it also sounds like they're going to have some back alley business deals going on. So I wonder if we'll see Brotherhood of the Woods men in um, the I guess the back alleys of the cities where we know that setting up criminal enterprises is possible and so maybe if you're going for more of that bandit king play style you if you're in Valandia you'll maybe end up coming into conflict with these guys over territory so that's interesting embers of the flame this is an imperial faction minor faction uh, they don't have a description though they are at war with all three Empire factions. That's pretty interesting. Uh, but no information about them. Okay. Well, moving on to the Hidden Hand. We get some information about these guys. They are also at war with all three Imperial factions. So the Hidden Hand are a mafia who dominate the rural areas and sometimes the towns of the southern parts of the Empire. They thrive by making themselves useful to authorities uh, so repressing unrest, silencing troublesome preachers, and robbing from merchants who complete, compete with their patrons, many of them go back and forth between a respectable life in the towns and a criminal life in the countryside, spending two or three months a year as a brigand and enforcer, and the rest as a trader in stolen goods, or a fence, uh, knowing full well that no one will bother them. Interesting, okay. So, uh, kind of similar to the Brotherhood of the Woods, although these guys seem to kind of fallen into criminal activity as a means of survival 
whereas these guys just kind of took it up as a business. And so I think kind of the same deal if you're looking up to set up a brigand empire in the imperial territory, you're probably going to uh, come in conflict with these guys. Or if you just want to be kind of a low-level bandit, maybe you can actually... I'm fairly certain they said you won't be able to join minor factions, which is a shame, I know. I was really hoping that we could, because that would add even more to gameplay regarding them, but I'm pretty sure that you can't unless they've changed that. So, yeah. Maybe we'll see them as mercenaries, but certainly as uh, criminal elements that you'll have to deal with one way or another. Okay, so the Legion of the Betrayed. Yet another Imperial Minor faction. The last Legion was created after the Emperor Arenicus enacted his reforms abolishing the last of the Empire's standing armies in favor of Archon's private retinues that were significantly cheaper and better at controlling territory. The Legion is made up of men who detested this change. They loved the old army, its standard, and its unit histories, and its camp life, and they blamed the new system for destroying the Empire. But an army does not hold together unless it's paid regularly, and they take contracts from Imperial and foreign lords alike. Alright, so they don't start out at war with anybody. Um, very similar to the Company of the Golden Boar, they seem to be more or less straight up mercenaries. I'm surprised that these guys don't... And maybe they do and it's just not represented well here. But maybe they have some ties to the Western Empire led by Garlos, because he's of course a, uh, a war hero and a famous general who I imagine is pretty popular with all the soldiers, and so if the former Emperor Arenicus is the one that abolished the legions, maybe they would see uh, Garlos as somebody who might restore them if he's in power. And so if you were role-playing in that regard, maybe if you're trying to you know, get Garlos onto the throne, or maybe you're trying to play a character similar to him, uh, like a famous general trying to, you know, overthrow everybody and claim the uh, throne for yourself. These guys would be perfect mercenaries for you to have, or maybe they could form the, the basis of your starting rebellion, at least. Because it seems like they would be kind of in line with that. Uh, and then we have the Wolfskins. This is a Batanian minor faction. So the Wolfskins are heirs to a long tradition in the Batanian lands, wherein great warriors went wilding for part of their youth, learning the ways of the woods and how to suffer hardship. So long as a wolfskin wears no sewn clothes, eats no cooked food, and sleeps under no roof, he is immune from the laws of men. In fact, the modern wolfskins tend to be the sons of wealthy families taking a few years to indulge their feral side, robbing travelers and living viciously and not necessarily hewing to the old code. Alright, um, they are at war with Batania. I can see why uh, Batania wouldn't particularly like this group running around doing what they do. It's not clear to me, based on the description, whether or not these guys would offer their services as mercenaries, but potentially they would. And they're obviously up to some forms of, you know, banditry and whatnot. So, again, criminal elements in Batania will probably have to work with these guys or against them to claim their territory. But it, it's difficult to say. I was sort of under the impression that every minor faction would be like hireable as a mercenary, but it sounds like some of them are very much mercenaries and some of them are more brigands that probably wouldn't necessarily be interested. I mean, maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. It's, it's hard to say. So it'll be interesting to find out whether all of these factions are available as mercenaries or if only some of them are. And then some of them are more focused on their, um, you know, criminal stuff that they've got going on to not worry so much about mercenary work. But I'll be definitely very curious as to how these are fully implemented because we only know a little bit about them. We know more about the individual minor factions than we do about overall how they work. Uh, so... Again, let me know what you guys want to see next in here. There's still quite a bit of stuff that we haven't covered. Uh, we've gone through the factions, the minor factions, the troop trees. We still have skills, game concepts. Uh, I'm probably not going to cover perks just because that would be really tedious. Uh, various information that I could kind of pick through. 
regarding various things. Um, we've kind of already seen the recruitment system. That's not a whole lot about villages, but we could try to just maybe talk about most of this stuff for whatever we feel is important. So yeah, let me know what you guys would like to see next. Uh, but otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I had a great time talking about some Bannerlord with you, and I look forward to seeing you guys back here for my next video.